Halifax Highlights. And here's your host, Karin Hamstedt. Greetings from Berlin and a warm welcome to our Highlights edition, coming at you this time with the following stories. Oktoberfest 101, an insider's guide to the world's biggest beer bash. On a roll, Roller Derby is making tracks here in Europe. The Art of Reduction, pared down designs by Jan Plechac. Well, as a formerly divided city, Berlin is the setting for many an espionage novel, and it was at the famous border crossing Checkpoint Charlie that Eastern and Western powers symbolically faced off at the height of the Cold War. Well, millions of tourists flock there every year to learn more about the city's history, but with the Berlin Wall long gone, it looks quite different today than it once did. So now a panoramic montage offers an eerie and detailed glimpse of what that division really looked like. Checkpoint Charlie has long been a magnet for tourists. Now locals too are expected to flock to the iconic former border crossing to revisit life in divided Berlin. The panorama transports visitors back to 1980s Berlin. It shows the view from West Berlin into the east on a grey November day. Music mixed with audio recordings from the era enhanced the experience. I've still got goosebumps. It would be impossible to imagine it, what I've just seen. I mean, I've seen the pictures on TV, but here you're in the middle of it, part of it. It's fascinating. It was very impressive. You really get a feel for the historical background. Yadiga Assisi, an artist with Persian roots, spent three and a half years working on the panorama. We're five meters from the Berlin Wall, looking over it from the west to the east. We see people living next to this wall, but they don't appear to register that they're living next to the Berlin Wall. Assisi portrays day-to-day -day life on both sides of the wall. Evoking an atmosphere is more important to the artist than historical accuracy. But his view is that of an historical witness. Assisi lived in this very neighborhood for a number of years. I experienced almost everything you see here. I didn't have to research it. My research was in my brain. The 57-year-old artist was born in Vienna and grew up in East Germany. In 1978, he was deported to West Berlin, where he lived close to the wall. The Iron Curtain was part of his neighborhood. For the panorama, he reassembled this world on his computer using drawings and countless photos that he shot with actors. It's not so easy to create the patina of this era. I had to find just the right accessories to make the era come to life, from the dilapidated facades to the old gumball machines. We have to be very consistent. The 15-meter-high and 60-meter-long panorama required the building of its very own rotunda and visitor tower. 20 rolls of fabric were printed and tacked together. It was a huge logistical and financial challenge. The problem with the panorama is that everything is huge and expensive. It's hard to believe that an individual artist can pull it off. But his perseverance has paid off. In 2003, his first gigantic panorama depicting Mount Everest was a huge success. His next nature panorama of the Amazon was even larger and more spectacular. To research his panorama of the ancient city of Pergamon, he travelled to the archaeological site in Turkey. The work depicted one day in the year 129 AD. Assisi takes all of his pictures from one point of view. 
That is always his approach. His 360-degree works have long since become a lucrative business. His wall panorama marks the first time he has chosen a theme from contemporary history. People will leave here saying, I just stood next to the Berlin Wall. The memory will stay very real. It might trigger more thoughts. How would I cope with this? Or the realization that I adjust to many things in my job and private life. It invites many questions and maybe even gives a few answers. For those who experienced the Berlin Wall, the panorama brings back memories. And those who didn't leave with a clear idea of what life was like in the shadow of the wall. Well, more light-hearted fare now as we head to Munich in southern Germany, where the one and only Oktoberfest is underway. A 16-day Bavarian beer festival that dates back to 1810. It attracts well over 6 million visitors every year, and as such, it's one of Germany's most famous events. Well, given those numbers, it can certainly be a daunting affair to visit. And so Moses Wolf has written an Oktoberfest handbook, and he gave us a handy list of tips. <laughs> Oktoberfest in Munich is 16 days of sheer lunacy. At least, that's the opinion of Moses Wolf, an actor who hails from Munich. He's attended the world's biggest beer festival for 35 years, which doubtlessly makes him something of an expert. In my view, Oktoberfest is 16 days of surrealism, as there's no other place on earth where people all feel the same thing at the same time. This crazed euphoria and joie de vivre. People cozy up and drink beer, and everyone's in the same jovial mood. And to ensure that visitors to Oktoberfest share in that mood, Moses passes on some tips. The most important one is to get dressed up in traditional Bavarian costume. This is a really lovely outfit. It's very simple, not overdone, with a ribbon. Some people put a little chain in here. She has a zipper, some have buttons. It's nice and simple. A lovely lady, a lovely outfit and great accessories. That's all you need. Wearing carnival costumes is a no-no. They're swim trunks. You're real, I'm fake. <laughs> Lederhosen and Dirndls make a fashion statement. It's the tradition. The costumes are simply lovely. Lovely men and lovely women in Lederhosen. We come from Switzerland, and I think if you come to the Oktoberfest, you've got to dress the part. Very interesting. Yes, so I like it very much. Thank you. There are around 130 fairground rides at Oktoberfest. Many are fast and loud. Some of the more traditional rides are just as spectacular. Moses recommends a ride on the Teufelsrad, or Devil's Wheel. Built back in 1908, it's just one of two such surviving rides in the world. It's spontaneous stand-up comedy. It's very funny to watch and it's also fun to ride on. It's everything you want from good entertainment. It's complete entertainment, a show in itself. But the Oktoberfest has other treats in store, like its full-flavored beer. With an alcohol content of around 6%, it's stronger than typical German lager. So for anyone indulging in the beer fest, our expert has some advice. At the Oktoberfest, you should eat before you start drinking, to cope with the beer better. Thankfully, the Oktoberfest boasts the best food in the world. Classics like roast chicken work well. It's pleasantly fatty, which is good because you can tolerate more beer. Paired with a fresh pretzel, mmm. 
Now for the highlight of our tour, a visit to the Hakka beer tent, also known as Bavarian Heaven. Most of its 9,000 seats are already filled by noon. Moses Wolf turns on the charm, the best method he knows to get a table. Those who want guaranteed seating should reserve six months ahead. If you haven't got a reservation and are in the tent, try to sit at a table. That usually works. Couples or those on their own can usually squeeze in somewhere. For the seven million visitors expected to attend this year, we've saved the best for last. At the world's biggest beer festival, there's a steadfast rule. What happens at the Oktoberfest stays at the Oktoberfest. i.e. lots of discretion is advised. Well, you have to be fast, you have to be tough and prepared to take more than a few bumps, bruises and even body checks. Roller derby is a contact sport that originated in the United States back in the 1930s. It amounts to a round race between two teams on roller skates and it is primarily played by women. Well, over the past decade, it has seen quite a revival and is gaining momentum here in Europe. And we checked out a home game for the German champion team in Stuttgart. This is one of the most important games of the year for the Stuttgart Valley Roller Girls. The rainy city roller girls from Manchester are in town and in a fighting mood. Denise Kaufmann is captain of the Stuttgart team. She's been with the club since it was founded, and she's been getting ready for this game for quite a while. I know how it all got started, and I know how far we've come. It gives me goosebumps when 1,300 people are screaming in the stands. Roller derby is easy to understand. The two jammers who have a star on their helmet score points by overtaking the four opposing blockers. It's all very hectic and seven referees are on hand to check that everything is above board. There's offense and defense at the same time. It's a very fast game. It's not easy, but that's what makes it so exciting. Promoter Leo Zetza came up with the idea for roller derby in the 1930s. It became hugely popular, but then fell out of fashion in the 1960s. The sport made a comeback in 2000 and has been growing in popularity ever since. The first two European roller derby teams were formed in 2006 in London and Stuttgart. When 30-year-old Denise Kaufmann isn't on her roller skates, she's normally in front of a computer. She's a communication designer. My day job is very quiet. I'm focused and work alone at my computer. I don't move very much, and there's nobody around but me. But at night, Denise is part of a team, and she enjoys the game's rough and tumble. You have to get used to the people wanting to get at your throat, which isn't usually part of daily life. It's really different, but it's a whole lot of fun. Roller derby is a contact sport. It can be dangerous because basically anything goes. Denise recently broke her thumb. We've had broken ankles, and that can get complicated. Broken ribs, fingers and noses aren't too bad. They heal pretty quickly. The game's about to start and things are getting tense. It's time for the final pep talk. The team gets revved up and the show can go on the road. All the players have roller derby alter egos. Denise Kaufmann becomes Tease the Tiger. Tease the Tiger is, Tease the tiger is more self-confident 
selbstsicherer and more aggressive. Und, äh, und I'm not like that normally. The game's about to begin. And it's not going well for the Stuttgart Valley Roller Girls who are outplayed for much of the game. But they're not giving up. They fight hard until the very end. But it's not enough. Manchester comes out on top, but nobody is crushed by the defeat. We'll win the third half. The aftermatch party like always. All I know is I want a beer now, that's all I know. <laughs> Maybe arrange a rematch for next year. During the game, the battle is for real, but as soon as it's over, the roller girls are best of friends. <laughs> well, over to the Czech Republic now, which has a great reputation as a beer brewing nation, but all through the Cold War years was not exactly a pinnacle in the design industry. Well, Jan Plechac from Prague is doing a pretty good job of raising his country's profile. And his creative furnishing started out as a design school graduation project. But since then, they've attracted quite some international attention. These design objects consist of nothing but black metal wire. In a way, they're three-dimensional sketches of iconic chairs. In the middle of a room, they may look like a computer graphic, but they're actually designed to be sat on. The chairs are the brainchild of Czech designer Jan Plechac. We like this idea, like to combine old stuff with the, the new things, with new ideas, and to make the new stories with old stuff. An 18th century Louis XVI chair served as the model for one of his wire designs. As did the early 20th century Kubus chair by Austrian designer Josef Hoffmann. Jan Plechac's Icon series has picked up numerous design awards and was exhibited at the prestigious Milan Furniture Fair. For me as a young designer, like what to, what to say, it was a yeah, great period for me. And I, of course, I would like to continue with that, but, yeah, but you never know. At his studio in Prague, the designer is working on prototypes for a new series called Poles. These pieces also feature clear lines, but making them is new territory for Plechac. My brain was like overcrowded just by wire, so I wanted to change the, the main material. So now we use the, uh, the wood and the metal as well, and we have one set of furniture which would be uh, just from the wood, from the timber. A long process of experimentation with materials and techniques precedes the finished product. These bottles and cork mats will be given a new lease on life as vases. Plekac devises his ideas and designs on the drafting table together with his design partner, Henry Vilgus. They met as students at Prague's Academy of Fine Arts. After finishing their degrees in 2010, they joined forces to set up a studio. We want to make simple things, cheap things for, for, for anyone, so it's our philosophy in general, but uh, we are not looking for philosophy at all, I think. We are just looking for great design. Like their sketchbook, a cart on wheels that becomes a drawing table when filled with paper. The designer has recently outfitted a cafe for artists and journalists in Prague with their sketchbooks. The Dock Center for Contemporary Art in Prague has included Plekac's debut wired chair series among the items on offer at its design shop. Most of the pieces for sale are by Czech designers. The shop aims to promote the work of a new generation of local talent. 
Czech design has developed rapidly in the past few years. That's especially because interest in design has grown since famous international brands opened up shops here. Jan Plechac and Henry Vielgus certainly aren't worried about running out of ideas. Their latest design is again something to sit on, but this time it's based on a perfectly ordinary bucket. Well, as soon as they're spotted on celebrities like Rihanna, Giselle Bündchen or even Heidi Klum, avant-garde fashion accessories quickly become a season must-have. Well, that is the way with sneaker wedges, which are like a sneaker or a running shoe high top with an internal heel. And the trend was kicked off by French designer Isabelle Maron, whose clothes are pretty synonymous with that effortlessly hip Parisian style. Now you can spot them everywhere, stepping up to some quite great heights all the while staying casually cool. Wedge sneakers are everywhere. Look around any fashion-conscious European city and you'll see these sporty shoes with an integrated wedge heel. Sneaker wedges are something new in fashion history. Of course, sneakers in themselves have been fashionable in recent years, and wedge heels have been around before. But what's new is the combination of these two trends, a comfortable running shoe combined with a sexy wedge heel. The shoes can be had in almost any material imaginable, like this mix of suede and leather. They also come in the season's hottest colors, metallic shades and red are in this fall. And these glittery models are sure to turn heads at parties. Glitter looks were really big in the 1980s. In the 1990s, hip-hop styles were cool. And now this is the amalgamation of these trends. The casual look of the hip-hop sneaker and the glamorous disco look of the 80s. French designer Isabelle Maron launched the footwear trend with her Willow model. It proved an instant sellout, even at 450 euros a pair. Now shoe stores everywhere are stocking versions of sneaker wedges. Models from designer brands like Giuseppe Zanotti and Prada sell for several hundred euros. But knockoff versions can be had for as little as 25. The mix of high heels and sneakers is pretty cool. They're too clunky. It doesn't work. The two styles don't go together. They're comfy, not like high heels, which kill your feet. They're fine. They make you look taller. Yeah, they're cool. If you find you can't put your best foot forward in wedge sneakers, sit out the trend. Heels have gotten progressively higher since the 1950s. They reached lofty heights with 70s platform shoes. Now even sneakers are sporting heels. Fashion editor Leah Lynn Bezier offers some tips on how to wear them. Basically, it's important to be comfortable with your look, especially when it's something as unusual as sneaker wedges. But as this is a sporty, quite chunky shoe, it's not for very short and dainty women. On them, it can look too big and overwhelming. Wedge sneaker fans say you can wear them anytime, in your free time, at the office, or on special occasions. Even to parties. The good thing is that you can really wear them with anything. There's nothing that's an absolute no-go. Still, it's important to pay attention to cuts, to make sure pants are slim enough. Classical leather leggings are great. You could also wear a dress, though it's important to team them with another sporty clothing item or accessory. 
Love them or hate them, sneaker wedges are hands down the most comfortable way to sport the off-duty model look. Which brings us sauntering right to the end of the show. That's all for our Euromax highlights. And until we meet again, all the best from us here in Berlin. And thanks for watching. Tschüss.